Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. Um, today we'll go over Unit 7, which is understanding uh, different environmental factors that are going to affect how plants grow, and that will include humidity, rainfall, and wind. Um, here's just a picture of uh, showing some water droplets on a plant since we're going to be uh, talking about it. This is a picture just of some uh, grass or weed. It's hard to tell from the picture, but just the droplets of uh, after a rainfall or it could be dew or it could be condensation because the humidity is too high. Um, what we're going to go over in, in this unit is defining different types of rainfall that you might have in an area and we'll find out that um, they all have different patterns. Um, sometimes it's hard to discern what the pattern is, but a lot of that has to do with the area that you're in. We'll explain uh, areas that have wet and dry uh, cycle agrosystems, and that's where they'll have an extended period of either wet or an extended period of a dry uh, time, and how plants would adapt to something like that. Then we'll review um, some of the problems that we have or solutions to problems that we have uh, in order to have water conservation because water is becoming a big issue because we're currently using it um, at a faster rate than what it's replenishing, which certainly is a big issue. Uh, we're also going to look at identifying the impact of wind on uh, plants in an agroecosystem. <clears throat> and what kind of, you know, adverse effects you have on them. Um, some are good, some are bad. And then how can we do things to try to use some of that wind to our advantage? And we'll find out through uh, windmills and turbines that we're able to do that. Um, a good indicator um, of the rainfall amount is based on what type of nat natural vegetation because you'll find out that the uh, vegetation will assist in um, uh, providing you a way to get more rainfall. Um, but in order to have an agroecosystem, you need to make sure you have an adequate amount of rainfall. If you don't have enough rain, you're not going to have the crops, therefore the ecosystem's not going to work um, and plants aren't going to grow in that area or they'd have to adapt if it was changing. Um, if it isn't an area that has an adequate amount of rainfall, you could uh, possibly do irrigation, put in an irrigation system, and then we'll talk about some of the issues as we go along because there are quite a few of them if we decide to irrigate ourselves instead of letting just normal rain fall. Um, the first area in looking at it is humidity, and humidity has two different forms. If it's vapor, in other words, it's, it's, it's just in the air, but it's not heavier than air, it's water vapor, it's in its gaseous form. And then once it gets heavy enough, it's heavier than air, it becomes a water droplet and that's what uh, comes down and that's what we get hit with with rain or condensation, whatever the case may be. Um, one of the big determining factors for humidity is temperature. And um, the, based on the temperature, it, it has varying amounts of vapor that the air can hold. Basically, as the temperature decreases, it reduces the amount that's going to be held in the air. In other words, as it gets colder, you aren't going to have as much moisture. The humidity is going to go down. Perfect uh, example is in the wintertime. You don't have as high a humidity as you do in the summer. The air doesn't feel as heavy. Um, some of the definitions with um, talking about humidity is dew point. We've all heard that on the weather. Um, but basically what dew point is, is just the temperature at which that vapor is going to turn into water. And it's just a measurement that meteorologists uh, have come up with um, so that we know at what point you're going to have that. It helps determine when you're going to have rain. Um, relative humidity, it's the ratio of your water vapor content, in other words, the gaseous form of the air, to the amount of wa water vapor that it can hold. Uh, 100% Humidity is equivalent to saturated air, and we've all heard you can have 80% humidity. The higher the humidity, the heavier it feels, the warmer you feel, the more uncomfortable you feel during the summer. Um, and then there's also fog, and that's a way that um, the fog is just the clouds coming down to the earth, and clouds are formed by water vapor. Um, and that provides the extra moisture, a lot of extra moisture for the plants. Even though it's not raining, the plants are going to benefit from that 
and they're going to need less rain because of that in an area that's uh, that has a lot of fog. Here's a picture of the hydraulic cycle. I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time with it, just a few seconds, but if after we go through talking about all the rain, you come back here, and it's just the different ways in which moisture is going to occur in an agroecosystem. Um, basically, you have condensation that's on in the clouds on either side of um, the picture, if you see those two clouds there. One comes from sublimation, um, and one comes from evaporation. The evaporation is when the sun's out, it evaporates off the ocean surface and goes up uh, and creates the clouds and makes that condensation. On the snows and glaciers, that's in a cool area, um, and that is when the snow's melting because the sun's there, it's going to go up the same way in which it does to the ocean. Um, also, another source of uh, water going up into clouds is evapotranspiration, and that's when the uh, plants that are there um, will give off water, um, and they call that transpiration when it comes off the plant, and when it becomes the vapor, it's the evapotranspiration. So fancy names, but very, very simple to understand. Um, the glaciers in that, you're going to have runoff when it gets warm enough. Some of that's going to run down into streams. It's going to come down and give water to the different plants. It could also go into uh, from streams into lakes, from lakes into oceans. It can also go down into the ground. You can see the groundwater on the bottom of it. It gets down there through percolation. In other words, when there's moisture that comes into an area, no matter what the source, it's going to do that. Um, so some of it will go down that way. That's where we get a lot of our water from that we're using for irrigation. Or if it gets into a stream or a river, they take it out of that. Lakes, they can take it out of also if it's large enough. And then eventually some of that gets to the ocean or to the gulfs. Um, some of it will flow over land, and if there's enough grass, it'll run off um, that way. Not all of it's going to go down into the soil moisture and become groundwater. So that's just a basic thing if you come out and, and come back and look at this later. Um, it, it kind of explains it, but it's a good thing to understand to know where that's coming from. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is then the rain, once it gets to the, the vapor gets heavy enough, that vapor turns into droplets, and then that's what comes down in for the rains. And those the two examples they show of the rain there, one is what you get over your land, in other words, at your house or uh, location that you are, and then the rain is just a cyclical cycle where it goes through um, uh, and, and it pulls it up from the ocean and it goes back into the ocean. So there's not as much left, uh, you know, in, in terms of losing water. Um, evaporation. It's at the Earth's surface, okay? And where does it evaporate from? Well, that prior one, we went quickly over that. It can come from soil. So in other words, when the sun gets there, some the moisture can come out of that soil. That's how the soil dries. Uh, it can come off of bodies of water like the ocean, the river, uh, streams, the lakes, any of that. So it's going to evaporate off of that. Um, any other wet surface, a car, the roof of your house, uh, the doghouse, any of those places it can dry off of and it'll come when it dries, it becomes that vapor and goes up and forms clouds. And then inside of plants, um, through the leaves, and that's actually through what's called the stomata. We talked about that in a prior chapter, a prior unit, and that's called the transpiration like we talked about in the prior slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, condensation. That's when the water vapor reaches or exceeds 100% relative humidity. Uh, and when it does that, the small droplets come together and then they form the clouds. Um, precipitation, that's when the droplets are heavy enough um, and change from vapor into the water droplets. And the warm air rises and then it begins to cool. And at the cooler temperature, it's not as capable, like we said before, the humidity changes. That's because the droplets are falling out of there, and that's why the humidity level changes. It goes down. Um, transpiration, um, we talked about that was from the leaves. That's the process of the water going out of the uh, leaves and back into the atmosphere. Um, advection was on the prior slide, and that's the movement of that moisture from one place to the other. So it was going from one cloud to the other. It was going to uh, from the 
you go run off into a stream or a river. Um, sublimation is when it changes from that solid state to the gas state. In other words, once it leaves the leaf or once it, it's drying off the thing, it becomes that water vapor. Um, and then on ice and snow, um, becoming water vapor uh, in, in the same way that it changes from the solid state from the water droplet into the other. It's just uh, snow or ice as opposed to water. And it just melts and becomes water and then becomes the water vapor. And then the evapotranspiration, it's any forms of liquid water evaporating um, from the atmosphere. So in other words, it's changing from that water drop into the water vapor and going into that cloud. Um, in terms of rainfall, it's categorized as three different types. And there's a convective, orographic, and cyclonic. And Without trying to describe them here, we'll go over what each one is, and it will certainly make sense. Um, the common one um, that we have in most areas is convective, and that's where air near the ground heats rapidly. It cools down and condenses the moisture, and that's when it gets, remember when it cools down, it gets heavy enough and it starts dropping, and that becomes that moisture. Um, you can also get it from a body of water if you're close to a lake or if you're close to like Lake Michigan or if you're close to an ocean. Um, you can actually have water that, uh, or rain that comes from the ocean. Um, during the summer, or some of the examples of common things are this, are summer thunderstorms. And that's because you have that real high temperature and that's when you start getting things like tornadoes and that too. Um, you get high winds also. Of course, that's going along with the tornadoes, but sometimes you just get winds without tornadoes, of course. Or a graphic, and that's when you're near a mountain range, or you know, even small hills you can get this, where it's forcing uh, colder air into the atmosphere. So where the cooler areas are, it will create the water droplet, and it, that is a big, big source for a lot of the streams and aquifers for water to um, come back in. It'll go down the stream, down the mountain, and the aquifers are just those areas underground. It's just groundwater. We commonly call it groundwater. Uh, cyclonic uh, rainfall, and this is where there's areas of low atmospheric pressure forming over the ocean, and this is the kind that, unless you're over in an ocean area, it's where it, the sun heats it up, it rises, creates the vapor, then it cools down, forms the cloud, precipitation is formed, and it falls back into the ocean. It's just a continual process of that occurring. Um, rainfall patterns. Um, the reason we cover rainfall patterns is it's very important um, to, when you were looking at this, that you know how much rainfall an area has, because if you're going to grow plants, they have to have water to survive. They all have a variable amount that they might need, but we have to know what the, uh, how much average rainfall is for an area, and you can look that up online, looking at the um, federal government has sites where you can go look at that. Um, but basically it varies, it can vary in an area, and when it does, it can have a bad impact. You can get too much rain. You can have too little rain. So We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, how much rain you get, of course, doesn't happen once a year. It happens over a time period, different areas of where we all live. There'll be differing amounts. But one thing you can say is if you have dry and wet periods, <coughs> they are very predictable. In other words, you're, you'll go through a period where it's a rainy period. You'll go through a period where it's a dry period. What you're going to grow, if you're growing crops, for instance, are going to vary based on what type of crop. So the ones that don't need a lot of water, you're going to plant in the dry period. The ones that need a lot of water, things like rice, uh, cranberries, you would grow in a different uh, your wet period. Uh, there's different intensities and durations, and certainly over the last <coughs> five years, at least in the Chicago area, I'm sure everyone's... Uh, well, I know anyone in the area has experienced, but people in other areas of the country uh, have experienced similar things. 
two inches of rain that you get over a 24-hour period is way different than two inches of rain in a few hours. If you get too much rain, you can get reach a point of saturation. In other words, the soil can't take it as fast as it's on the ground. When that happens, that when, that's when the runoff's going to occur. And that's when we were talking a few slides back about the amount you get how much goes into rivers, streams, and oceans, it depends on how often or how long a time period it falls. If you have a light rain over a longer period of time, you're going to get more of that water that's going to go down into the water table. If it's a shorter time period, it's going to, more of it's going to run off. And that's what creates, and we'll talk about some of the issues you have um, when you have too fast a runoff, or too fast a rainfall, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> in rainfall patterns, um, how much moisture stays in the soil and it becomes the moisture that's used for the plants because the roots will go down to the uh, areas that keep the water and it'll grab what it needs so that they can grow. Uh, predictability as, is kind of an important issue because as it becomes more variable, it becomes less predictable. And, it, and it's kind of like a thing that um, in that wet, dry ones, they're always the same, so they know what's going to happen. They have their wet period, they have their dry period, so it's very, very easy to predict what it is. Some areas, that's not so true, but in areas where it's variable, it's becoming more and more that it's less and less predictable, so it's hard to know when you're going to get it. Basically, what that means in a nutshell is you might not be getting enough rain or you might be getting too much rain during certain periods, and you can't predict what that's going to be. For water cycles, um, they have four different types, and it's basically it's based on the amount of rainfall that you get during a period. There's a seasonal rainfall that we're going to look at, and that's what most of us have. In other words, it's over a certain period of time of the year, let's say. Um, you have a long wet season. That's in areas that are warmer, the more tropic areas. Uh, and then alternating wet dry that's also in some of the different tropic areas we have. And then there's some areas that are arid, the dry lands, the desert areas, <coughs> that they're pretty much always dry. They don't get a lot of rain at all. Um, here's an example it's just to show if you have wet and dry cycles uh, of a area that you can see the water level is very low right now. Um, it happens to be in a drier cycle. Um, but it also, if you look and see how high that wall goes up there, there's stuff growing there. So obviously it's been a dry period for a while, but you're going to get a wet period where that will fill up um, and you won't see as much of the wall. But they have it high enough to handle and deal with the amount of water they're going to get during their wet period. For seasonal rainfalls, the area which is most common, it relies on normal rain cycles. Um, you don't have to use irrigation. That's most of the areas that we have, the, the large farms or the crops, the soybeans, uh, the alfalfa, the wheat, that you, that's what you grow there because those are ones that don't have to have rain every day and they'll last for a while and their root systems will go deeper. Uh, but they don't have to have irrigation either, which would be very expensive, and in a lot of areas you wouldn't have enough to even water it if, if, because you wouldn't be able to grow stuff like that. You wouldn't have enough water to do it. Um, like I said, there's the corn and soybeans, so they're adaptable. Uh, and then the plant selection you have is extremely critical. You wouldn't want to put um, certain plants uh, in, in an area if you didn't get a lot of rainfall. Like rice wouldn't grow in the Midwest very well because, unless you decided to irrigate it. Here's an example of for a wet and dry cycle. This of course is the wet cycle and that's where the uh, field is flooded and this is a, a flooded sugarcane field uh, in Colombia, uh, South America near Cali and it's just shows you an example of the sugar cane and it's still growing and it's fine because it likes a lot of rain or it can handle a lot of rain. Uh, this happened with in let's say the Midwest with corn or soybeans. If that water was there for very long you wouldn't have corn or soybeans. It would turn yellow and it would die. Um, long wet season you're gonna have to have obviously crops that would grow well in it um, and they like the water. They're generally very humid they have extended rainfall, so you could go for days and days of having rain. 
Um, sometimes, though, it does create issues if you have too much rain that you can get waterlogged. Based on too much of it, you might get root diseases. Nutrient leaching would be where the nutrients in the soil, because it's so wet, that it actually, when the water goes away, it pulls the nutrients away. So the nutrients you need could be washed away and you wouldn't have them, so you might have an issue with that. And of course, whenever you have a lot of rain, there's always weed issues. Weeds love, love, love moisture. Um, if you have alternating wet and dry seasons in the tropic areas, <clears throat> um, generally it's a very high level of average. Uh, if you take it compared to what most areas are, it's a lot more rain. Um, most of the rain falls just during the wet season. That's why they say it's a wet, dry cycle um, season. And then what farmers have to do in that area is they have to have crops that will grow in either one, or they just grow them in <clears throat> one of the different seasons. But most areas, they'll grow two crops. And here's an example of a wet and dry. Here happens to be uh, uh, certainly they're using the dry stuff. So they're growing, uh, in this case, it looks like it's alfalfa or wheat. Um, in a dry land area, um, the irrigation isn't possible. There's no way to get it. In other words, there's not enough water. They're in semi-arid regions of the world where this occurs. There's special types of farming that they do. Um, they do uh, things like cultivate, promoting water retention. So they'll build uh, the crop up, and then there'll be areas where if the water does come down, it will fall, and it'll be next to these raised areas, and it's easy for the water to get into the root system. Um, they will, during fallow periods, and fallow periods is when they don't have a crop, they'll try to replenish their water reserves. In other words, they'll store it somewhere. <clears throat> they'll try to use drought-resistant plants, the so ones that would adapt to the different um, conditions. And then they use the dull dust mulch, and that's what's left um, in an area after they get the crop out. They call it dust mulch uh, to try to control the weeds. That's what's over it during those uh, fallow periods. And water conservation practices, um, there's water harvesting systems in the arid regions where they'll collect the water uh, in canals or a catchment area. It could be from a sloping land, it goes into a pond, and they'll use it based on that. The canals are real common uh, in California where they get uh, water, there's aqueducts, they call them, uh, and they basically take water, in the case of California, from the Colorado River, and they bring it to California in order to use it for growing the vegetables. Vegetables need a lot more water, and they don't get enough rain in California but they have the right temperatures and it grows well in the type of soil that they have. Uh, in grazing systems, for if we're gonna uh, worry about water conservation, uh, we try to use perennial grasses and shrubs because basically on those, they require less growing time and they, they need a lot less moisture uh, to grow. If you're growing a crop and, and the grazing land is where the animals are gonna be, uh, the other thing you need to do for water conservation, uh, because the animals are out in that area you know, living, eating the, the grasses that are there, um, you want to have the least amount of moisture needed they can. When they're eating the plants, there's moisture in the plants, so they're getting a good portion of the, of the water that they need from the plants that, that they're eating. Um, but in order to do that, you have to make sure there's not too many animals. You can put too many animals in an area, and they could wipe the area clean of vegetation, and then that's not going to help them uh, either. One of the things they do, and especially uh, if you have a farmer that has a couple hundred acres, let's say, they'll move their herds to different pasture lands so they don't eat it all out. So they just put the fencing up so they can keep them in one area or another uh, in order to do that. Um, and then um, they actually put in drought tolerant plants also if you're in that uh, if you're in an area that would not uh, you, you want if you want to conserve it put it in a plant that you don't have to worry about how much water it uses uh, and there's just a picture of some wetlands again in a wet period um, sustainable irrigation issues uh, some areas if you want plants to grow uh, California is a good example 
um, in an arid area, if you decided to try to grow stuff in a desert, probably not real advisable, but in some areas they're doing it. Um, you need it if you want those plants to survive. But some of the issues you have is there's salinization. And salinization is <clears throat> when you irrigate, there's salt that's left over. It becomes to a point where there's too much salt in the soil, so it basically poisons uh, the soil so plants won't grow after a while. Um, in soil erosion, if you get irrigation, it's not always put on the right way. So some of that water is not going to go into the ground like you want it to, and it's going to run off. So that's where the erosion comes in. Sedimentation is just the opposite. That's when uh, the earth is moved around and it forms uh, clumps or piles in different areas. And you can have a problem with that when you're irrigating. Too much water gets in an area, so the, the soil runs off with it and moves it from one place to the other. Um, you could also have a loss of watersheds or natural wetlands. Um, a watershed, we're going to have a, a picture in the next slide um, showing what a watershed is, but it's just an area where the water's going to, um, where all the water comes out of into a creek or a stream or a river. Um, but you can have some problems when you irrigate because you're putting too much water, possibly if you're putting too much water in it, you can lose a natural wetland that you have because it changes the nature of the agroecosystem. And then here's a picture of, uh, in Illinois, this happens to be the Illinois River, and all of the lighter yellow that you see here is the area of a watershed, and that's where when, if rain comes down, everything that doesn't go into the ground will come in eventually to this watershed, which happens to be the Illinois River, that happens to come up here by uh, the Joliet area in Will County is where that is, it's LaSalle County is where most of it is at the beginning, and basically um, all that water will come in there and that's how the rivers get, you know, they get some rain, but obviously from the watershed it's all sloped toward the area of the river there. And that's where the, uh, if you look at an area, if you go up to the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, they have maps where you can see this just about every area. You can pick an area where you live and see more detail of creeks. This is a whole state level where it's talking about a watershed, but there's certainly creeks in there that it would help get it to the Illinois River too. And this slide here are all of the attributions for the pictures we have in this unit. <clears throat>